So journey with me um, back to that first day of school. Uh, it was a very, you know, a, a very crazy time. You were trying to figure out the night before what to wear, trying to figure out, you know, how your first teacher was going to actually accept you, how that first group project was going to go. It was a critical defining moment for us. And what I'd like to talk to you about tonight, I mean, today, is that America's in a very defining moment. That defining moment is shaking America at its core because communities of color that have been historically and systemically disenfranchised from economic opportunity and educational pathways are not at the heart of our future as a country. When we think about what America has shifted into, or our global economy has shifted right. into, we've moved Why from not? an industrial economy into a knowledge-based economy. And in that knowledge-based economy, industry has a significant pain point around finding and keeping the right talent. Actually, 82% of businesses across the nation say that finding and keeping the right talent is the key to their long-term success. But half of businesses across the nation have revamped how they grow talent locally, connect to that talent, and then retain that talent. Because 50% of businesses across the nation also says that talent development retention has high impact on their ability to meet their clients' needs. The reality is, is that businesses are in a war for talent. There are 3.5 million jobs that are currently uh, vacant in America that are mid-skill level to entry level jobs. So when we think about this shift that is occurring across the nation, there also is a shift that is occurring across our labor market as well. By 2020, millennials will make up 50% of the labor market. This is the most generational diversity our nation has faced since the entry of the baby boomers. Now, while 50% of the labor market is waving in from the millennial generation, 33 million, or excuse me, 17 million baby boomers will be exiting the labor market with their intellectual knowledge on the technical aptitudes and skill sets industry needs to drive its business forward. Now of that, half of the labor market, that is millennials, one out of every seven are currently out of school and out of work. We call these young people opportunity youth. Young people between the ages of 16 to 24, young Americans that are out of school and out of work, and over 72% are young people of color. When we think about this, though, in the, in the shift of, of America's economy, we also see that this is the first time in history that Smith wasn't the, last, the most used surname. Rodriguez is. When we think about where America is going and in, in, in our economy, we know that multicultural buying power over the last 20 years has raised 415%. The economic engine, or the fuel that fuels our economic engine as a country, is multicultural buying power. But if we extracted the young people of color that are out of school and out of work in America, this multicultural buying power would actually be cut in half. It's costing America $93 billion a year to not have these young people connected, to not have these young people have access to career opportunities and educational opportunities that industry needs in order for us to maintain our position as a country as a global competitor. So it's not just about young people having access to jobs in pocket, in pocket change, but it's actually about America having the consumer base it needs to fuel its economy moving forward. This is a very interesting and jarring perspective that I saw a couple of months ago, actually the world saw from Times Magazine, where it juxtaposed the reality that we were facing in the civil unrest due to social inequities and economic inequities across our country that made us think, has times really changed? We ex luxuriate in Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. 1968 was the year he was assassinated. But we forget about his last two to three years of life when he was actually challenging America to open up pathways for economic opportunity. And here we are, some 50 years later, where we're still facing the same issues that Martin Luther King was, was, was combating back in 1968. And the challenge is, is America, because historically these communities have been disenfranchised from opportunity, can we sustain ourselves as a global innovator and competitor without opening up broad pathways to economic opportunity for young people that have been historically disenfranchised? So the challenge. The challenge is that as America, we now have to rethink how we engage millennials and connect them to the economy. We have to rethink 
how we actually challenge that your zip code should not define your place in America. There are young people in South LA that live the same life as agribusiness um, uh, workers in Central America in regards to their access to edu education opportunity, health care, and a livable wage. So the question is, we've been developing a very big unbalanced equation where diminished opportunity and access to opportunity and an unskilled workforce is actually turning our very robust middle class into an our economy into an hourglass figure of, a, of middle class. And we all know that America was built on the backs of a thriving and robust middle class. And I present to you today that we cannot afford to not have young people grow with upper mobility into the middle class and even into the upper class as we thrive as a nation that is now being led by a minority majority. So the question is, how do we ensure that the future is at work? There's a couple things as a workforce development practitioner that I've taught and thought around for the last 10 years to really think how can we get this issue of 5.6 million young people at, um, solved at scale. It seems like a Herculean challenge, but there are things that we can do in America because of our ingenuity and our innovation and our willingness, to, uh, our tenacity to actually solve issues to get this right across the nation. The number one thing is that we have to activate industry. As practitioners in this space and youth development and workforce development, we've been training and hoping and praying that young people would get jobs. But the reality is, is that we need to take a step back and take a, book, a page out of the book of Se uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and start with the end in mind. If you are in the employment game, your end user is not the young people that you serve. It's who? The employers. So the question is, how can we get industry to tell us and move back to the center of the workforce development conversation around what do you need, not just today, but from your future workforce? What competencies are needed to drive value in your industry and innovate on top of those uh, the strategies in place that is going to take your business from being a possible blockbuster to a Netflix? What is it going to take for industry to tell us what they actually need so that then we can train with certainty? The reality is, is after we activate industry, there are a million different apparatus that we can use. So at Leaders Up, our strategy is a supply chain activation strategy. Back in 2013, Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, uh, convened some of his largest suppliers to talk about a new global sourcing and supplier relations strategy. And from one business leader to the next, he challenged the suppliers to be more intentional about impacting the communities that they operate in. How? By simply doing what businesses do. Create jobs. Give young people livable wages. Access to health care. Access to career pathways and, and educational pathways, tuition reimbursement. Because the reality is, is that one business will not be able to solve this challenge by themselves. To make that plain, Starbucks actually hires 25,000 people locally, um, domestically in the U.S. If Starbucks channeled its whole workforce development strategy towards this issue of 5.6 million young people, they would never get this issue solved. But when you take a supply chain of 18,000 companies and then channel that towards the U.S. Unemployment, youth unemployment issue, the, issue the, the challenge becomes something that we can face at scale. We've seen how supply chains has revolutionized uh, response to disasters as we're at the heels of the 10-year anniversary of the levee incident in New Orleans. I'll call it what it is, not Katrina. As we look at uh, responsiveness to um, dissemination of vaccinations or even the sustainability movement, supply chains have been able to solve or at least tackle global issues at scale. And our strategy is that if we activate businesses, not just through workforce development strategies where we're just offering up young people that are actually trained against their demand, but then prove to them that there's a bottom line impact on how they can save in talent development and talent retention strategies, that there'll be a shift in how businesses think about these young people from the other side of the tracks. After we activate industry, we must skill at scale. 
Our workforce development system needs to be able to respond to demand in real time with alacrity, with agility, with the ability to train young people against what um, employers actually need. We're very grateful for the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act that now requires that workforce development systems funded by the Department of Labor actually train young people against career opportunities in high growth sectors. But the reality is, is that 2,000 and 3,000 and 4,000 young people trained a year in major markets is not going to allow us to solve this issue at scale given the system that we currently have. So we have to scale at scale. But last but not least, it's all about measuring what matters. So as practitioners in this space, we love to talk about the social impact issue uh, uh, metrics. We love to also talk about the public benefit impact metrics. But now we have to convert this to the business imperative metrics. Showing businesses by partnering with us that we can reduce your interview to higher ratio to save on talent um, development strategies. That we can actually increase your retention in order to save on turnover rates, which is the number one metrics that businesses face when they're talking about their HR strategies. That we can actually combat the two-year tenure of millennials compared to seven-year tenures in companies like baby boomers through by explicitly painting out career pathways for these young people, for them to grow through the company simultaneously. We have to measure what impacts the P&L of businesses in order to get them to take this issue by the horns and actually solve it with us. So the question is for us, as we look at San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, major economies across the nation that are currently driven by minority, majority populists, how do we ensure that everyone across the nation realizes that an inclusive economy is a competitive economy? Thank you and have a great morning.